Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. We're here today with our first Cabral host call of the weekend. Hopefully, you've been having a great week. Looking forward to being able to now reconnect on our Saturday and Sunday editions of the show and really see what the community is saying. So each and every week, we're looking at what wellness, what weight loss, what anti-aging struggles that people might be going through so that we can better set them on the right track. And that's really what this is all about. It's beginning the journey. And a lot of people have already been on the healing journey now. But what we want to do is we want to get them on that right path, make it a little bit easier for them, the right labs to choose, the right protocols to choose, and really get into this at maybe a deeper level as to why they might be suffering from these specific issues in their body. So uh, always love going through that. We've got our uh, our iPad right here of all of your questions that have come in. These are actually from uh, September 4th, and, sorry, 14th, all the way through about the 16th or 17th today. So if you wrote in before September 18th or so, uh, your question will be answered on this show or it was on a previous show. All of those previous shows are at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. And of course, this show is now on video and you can watch it each and every day uh, on that particular show notes page or you can go right to YouTube and subscribe right over there and it's just Stephen Cabral, my name, and you're able to watch it on video. So why don't we dive into our questions because that is why we are here today. We'll get in about six questions, which is what we typically do each and every Saturday and Sunday, 12 questions for the weekend and uh, let's get started. So first question today is from Patrick. Patrick is saying, hey, Dr. Brawl, huge fan, love your podcast and all the work that you're doing. I go to the gym about three days a week and hit the weights for about 30 minutes. I never heard you mention anything about isometric exercises. Can you go over some of the pros and cons? I'm just looking to switch up doing the same thing all the time and maybe get more toned and increased strength. Thanks for all you do. All right, well, I have talked about isometric exercises before a long time ago. You're able to search that at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast and just use that search bar to type in isometric and it will be on a training Thursday show from many, many years ago, about four years ago. And um, so what I want to share with you is this. There's nothing wrong at all with doing isometrics. What I would even say, if you want to get, I would say, even greater benefit, is choose a comfortable weight that you could do for anywhere between 8 and 15 repetitions, any exercise that you're used to doing. Like you could do the same routine. But what you're going to do is simply hold your contractions for longer. All right, so there's more time under tension. For example, let's say that you're doing a cable chest press. You could do that cable chest press 15 reps in 15 seconds if you wanted to. Or you could take your arms... We could bring the weights together, squeeze your pectoral muscles together, hold that contraction for five seconds, 10 seconds for each one, and then try 10 reps like that. Well, now you're looking at a minute to a minute and a half for that exercise, and your muscles are going to be on fire in a good way. So you can always increase your time under tension, uh, which would be an isometric contraction. So uh, Patrick, feel free to add that into any one of your workouts. You don't need to do it all the time, uh, but certainly it works great for a drop set uh, or it works great for basically adding a little bit more spice to any workout and it can add, actually work fantastic as well for a exercise, an exercise that you're beginning to plateau on, meaning you can't increase weight. That's okay. If you can't increase weight, increase the reps or increase your time under tension with isometric contraction. All right. Cynthia is up next. Hello. I've been hearing quite a bit about water filtration. I have a water filter built into my refrigerator and was wondering if you have a recommendation for the type of filter I should purchase or the standard filter is sufficient in providing clean drinking water. All right. Well, here's the thing. A great refrigerator is a great refrigerator specializing in refrigeration and design, but I've never seen a great refrigerator also be a great water filter. They do okay, but certainly not great. And if you've checked out my podcast this week on fluoride toxicity, trust me, you need to find that right water filter. So uh, what I'm recommending is that you uh, you can use the water that comes out of your refrigerator if you choose to, but really not a need to. What you'll do is you'll just use regular tap water if you choose to, and then what you're going to do is use your favorite water filter. I did a whole podcast on water filters for every price range, so simply go to uh, stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, 
type in water filter, you'll absolutely find it. Uh, or go to stephencabral.com forward slash resources and you'll find my water filter uh, re recommendation there. Or you can go to cabralsupportgroup.com and say, hey everybody, I can't find Dr. Cabral's podcast on water filters. Can you let me know what number it is? And we'll help you there as well. So no matter what, we'll help you get started. And I break down all the different variations from the kind that you can pour to countertop to reverse osmosis to whole house filters. So there's a little bit for everybody right there. Thanks, Cynthia. Liz is up next. I'm currently in the midst of my second round of the seven-day detox and love it. Maybe not the first two days. I'm a graduate of IIN, trainer, and currently work for Beauty Counter, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Our standard for clean living, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with yours. With that said, I'm wondering if you have a referral program for the detox program. I recently have referred 12 people for the seven-day detox, so I have to ask, as I know many other companies do have this. I love the products. I've also tried Fatlocity and love listening to Dr. Brawl's podcast. Please let me know if this is something you offer. Thanks, Liz. Liz, well... So hopefully someone got back to you in terms of our customer service team, because it's more of a customer service question. Um, but every one of our members of the Integrative Health Practitioner Institute, whether it's level one or level two, after 30 days, they are welcome to become an ambassador for equilibrium nutrition. And, um, and yes, we do pay a commission for referrals that they might uh, recommend in their practice, whatever it might be. Because it's always my philosophy that as a healthcare practitioner or an influencer in your regard or health coach is that you're answering and you're doing so much free work for people and you've done all the research that why can't you make a commission for a company that you believe in? So again, I'm, I'm a big believer in abundance in all areas and um, simply email support at equilibriumnutrition.com. Let them know uh, that you'd like to apply to become an ambassador and then you can absolutely make a commission on that, um, no doubt about it. So we always let IHPs and then other people are on a uh, review application basis. So IHPs are automatically, uh, basically, they never never even have to refer, but basically IHPs can get a, um, a commission, essentially a discount on their own products if they choose to. It's just one extra fun thing that we like to do for our IHPs. If you wanna learn more about that program, uh, we have a lot of people from IIN uh, that used to do, or that did IIN, and um, this is simply the next level for them. And that's at integrativehealthpractitioner.org. Uh, we do complimentary phone calls every single day, discovery calls to let people know more about the program. You're welcome to sign up for uh, a discovery call to see if it's the right fit for you. But thank you, Liz. All right. Melanie is up next. Hi, Dr. Ball. Thank you for helping me and my family transform how we feed and take care of our bodies. I subscribe to numerous wonderful supplements on equilibriumnutrition.com. Can you please help me with the rarely discussed and horrible tonsil stones? I know you haven't, I know you don't have your tonsils, so you probably don't have any experience with these. However, I still have mine and struggle to stay on top of expressing these from the back of my mouth. Is there anything I can do to control their formation? Um, you're right. I don't have my tonsils. I don't have my adenoids. Uh, those were basically removed, cut out of my body, tore out of my body uh, at a young age. And then my adenoids again, believe it or not, uh, at 21 years old. So I had, the, um, I had the joy of being able to remove whatever was still left uh, at the age of 21. And then probably it happened at like eight or nine years old when I was younger. Uh, but of course, I've worked with tonsil stones because I do have a nat natural health practice and see many, many people in my practice. I believe I've already answered this question. So I'm going to try to do what I uh, can't do as well on this little iPad here. But I am going to... Um, Go to stephencabral.com and I'm going to look up tonsil stones because I believe I've answered that question before. So let's see if I did. Okay, just going to hit here. Again, I'm going through it the same way you would, podcasts, and then I'm going to go to the uh, search box. I'm going to type in tonsil stone. And we'll see if it pops up with anything. And then if not, I'll answer your question. Uh, not a problem at all. All right, tonsil stones, tonsil stones, episode 989 and episode 457. So definitely check out those shows. Uh, those should be your answer right there. But let me give a quick synopsis as well. So with tonsil stones, what I typically do is I work on the detox properties of the body and I also use magnesium, which can help prevent some of the calcification there as well. So 
uh, there's three ways to do it. Detoxification, of course, fixing the gut, removing the food sensitivities, whatever's still causing inflammation. So that's a big one. I look at uh, using the neti pot and um, if there's any yeast overgrowth, fungal overgrowth in the nasal passages, we'll use a little citrocytal drops. We might do the CBO protocol. Of course, we're doing the functional medicine detox. Um, what else can I tell you about that? And we're doing the throat sprays as well. So we're using the uh, maybe like a Nutribiotic uh, throat spray, which contains zinc, as well as grapefruit seed extract. That can be a great one. Um, also gargling with what's called fire cider or fire tonic. Doing that in the AM, doing that in the PM. Both of those things work. And you can also swallow that after you're done gargling if you want, or just spit it out if it's too strong for you. So those are some great places uh, to get started. You definitely want to paint the tonsils though. Not just, yes, you want to work internally, CBO protocol, neti pot, uh, remove food sensitivities, you know, run your labs for sure, the big five, or at least the gut-based ones, and a detox, yes, and then uh, magnesium, yes, to counter the calcium buildup, and then you want to also paint the tonsils, we call it, but by just spraying some uh, echinacea, propolis, zinc, grapefruit seed extract, something, I've gone through many throat sprays before, of what's going to help those tonsils as well. So hopefully that's helpful, and uh, again, that, that fire cider works great as well. All right, let's get to our next question. How are we doing on time? We're doing great on time. All right, good. And, okay. Serena is up. Hello, Dr. Rawl. I'm about to have my first colonic ever, and I really want to make the best out of it. I want to flush away as much yeast, bacteria, parasites, toxins as possible. Do you have any tips on foods and supplements to use prior to the procedure in order to get this waste moving and maximize the detox. Also, is there anything else that you would advise on doing prior and after colonics as far as diet, exercise, lifestyle is concerned? Thanks in advance for your help, Serena. Okay, so, uh, well, what I recommend is that, remember, and I did a big explanation of this on an IHP monthly question, but remember, and I, and I um, you can't see it right now, but it's in the background, my, my little... Uh, medical model of all the different organs. When you're doing a colonic, I really want to be able to explain this. And I, and I please check out my um, uh, podcast on coffee enemas as well. But when you do a colonic, you are only flushing the five to six feet of the colon. So your all your intestines are about 26 to 28 feet, but you don't actually get water into the small intestine, which means it would, because it would have to move through the ileocecal valve. So the cecum is the first part of the large intestine, also known as your colon. And then there's a valve that moves then to the ileum. And it's a one-way valve, at least it's supposed to be. It can be open actually with what's called um, ileocecal valve uh, dysfunction, where that can then lead to SIBO and bacterial overgrowth with some people. So there's a couple things you should know about colonics. One is that I always recommend working with a practitioner rather than doing the machine-based colonic. And the reason is that the machine-based colonic, it's allowing water to always trickle in and waste to always come out. The problem with that is it's really only going up maybe 18 inches to two feet. When you work with a qualified colon hydrotherapist is what they're called, they're able to do massage-based techniques on your colon. Much of it is Ayurvedic-based uh, in nature. And it'll, it then enables them to get more water in, and then they allow you then to empty your colon. So then all the waste comes out. Then they allow the water to filter back in, goes a little bit further, and then all the waste comes out. And they keep repeating the process for about an hour. And so by the end, sometimes in your first session, sometimes it doesn't happen to your second or third, they're able to get all the way to the end of that colon. So they move up the uh, descending colon, they move across the transverse, and then um, they move down the ascending colon. So kind of in reverse. And they do that through, again, gravity-fed water or a different type of machine. So the process enables you to wash and actually tonify the colon itself. Now, um, there's a lot of controversy, obviously, behind this. I don't have a problem with it for about three, five, three to five sessions, three to six sessions, when you're going through something like the CBO protocol or you're trying to remove stuff from the colon. But remember, um, it's not going to move on the small intestine, so it doesn't do anything really for the SIBO um, or a lot of the yeast overgrowth there, etc. It, what it does is it works on the colon. So if there are things going on in the small intestine, it really doesn't touch that. So there's that part to it. Certainly it works with uh, fecal impactment and maybe some of the bile films there. Um, so again, I'm not against it. 
uh, but I don't typically recommend them for ongoing use. Like once you get your microbiome balanced, then I don't necessarily uh, recommend going back. Now, coffee enemas are a little different. Coffee enemas are really about liver detoxification rather than the, the colon um, emptying, okay? So what do I recommend after a colonic? Well, I would recommend the clean gut probiotic. Uh, so there you go. So certainly you can do an intestinal cleanse the week before you go for your colonic. So basically ending a couple days before your colonic. And that will help with the passage because that actually hits the entire intestine because you're you're using it orally. If you want to find the intestinal cleanse, um, you can simply go to equilibriumnutrition.com. And uh, what else can I share with you? And then, yes, I would use the clean gut probiotic and maybe even the healthy gut support to heal and seal and add more good probiotics uh, to the colon and the small intestine. So again, there's no treatment protocols here. There's no diagnosis of disease, no cures. We're not talking about that. We're talking about good, healthy, natural living. So uh, Serena, hopefully that was helpful. All right, let's get in one more question from Anna. Anna says, hi, Dr. Paul. Have you ever seen a correlation between your period and eczema and rosacea? I've never noticed. I've noticed that I get the worst flare-ups at the exact time every month. Is this even possible? Uh, Anna, thank you for writing in. Not only is it possible, it's actually quite common. Now, there's a difference between common and normal. So it's not normal, but it is very common with a lot of the women that I work with in my practice. And, and again, I oversee all of these labs, uh, of course. So here's what I want to share with you is that there is the uh, follicular phase of a, a female cycle. There's ovulation. There's the luteal phase. During those phases, we have uh, a higher uh, ratio of estrogen to progesterone. And then um, we're, we during ovulation, we're starting to get an uptick in testosterone. And we're starting to get that spike then in progesterone. Then during the luteal phase, we're supposed to have a greater uh, progesterone to estrogen ratio. So all of that is supposed to be how it works. It doesn't always work that way. So what happens is with estrogen dominance, which happens in many women, and it's really felt about a week or so before you do get uh, day one of menstruation, um, before your period begins, is that you'll see a flare-up in skin issues. You'll see a flare-up in sometimes bloating, uh, irritability, lower mood, depression. And the reason is that there are massive changes within the body, and there's also this dis dysregulation between estrogen and progesterone. Now that estrogen dominance also affects the liver, okay? So it kind of backs things up, creates more inflammation, and it affects it can affect the thyroid as well. So now you have this lowered metabolic rate, you've got excess inflammation in the body, and now for you it's showing up as psoriasis uh, or it's showing up as eczema and rosacea. So eczema and rosacea are obviously inflammatory-based issues. They can have many deeper uh, levels of issue as well. And um, I would look at running just for you the stress hormones mood and metabolism test uh, when you get the symptom flare up. And I would run that along with the starter kit ideally. And that would be a great telltale sign of what the underlying root causes are to what's causing you to have these flare ups. So, uh, Anna, hopefully that was helpful. And um, you know what? We did it. We answered six questions today. Uh, excited to be able to reach out, speak with our community, hopefully give them a good place to get started. Always happy to do follow-ups as well. And of course, you can ask your questions uh, for daily answers. We're about four or six weeks behind on the Cabral House Calls, but you can get daily answers over at cabralsupportgroup.com. And uh, just wanted to, again, thank all of you. Please, of course, continue to share this show, share this information with anyone you believe it could serve. And don't forget, tomorrow, I'll be back answering more of our community's questions. Take care, everyone. <laughs>